Uh, welcome to our uh, pre-meeting. Uh, we'll kind of dis discuss the history of the count and Christmas bird counts. We'll go over uh, count rules and procedures, uh, areas and assignments, look at a number of bird species that are typical on the count, and a whole whole bunch of stuff. Um, I think we'll save questions till the end, but if you do have a question, just uh, pop it in the chat window and we'll address those uh, at the end of the presentation. So the history uh, of the Christmas bird count, uh, initially there were bird side hunts where people went out to shoot as many birds as they could on Christmas Day, which doesn't seem too much fun to us today. But Frank Chapman, a member of the early Audubon Society and eventually became curator of birds at the American Museum of Natural History, had the idea of a bird count instead of a bird shoot. And so we're still doing this to this day. The first one was conducted in 1900. It actually was coast to coast, but with only 27 participants on 25 counts. And they got 90 species and about 18,500 birds in total. Today, uh, counts have about 77,000 participants on 2,100 CBCs and typically record about 254 species, 2,554 species. Uh, the, and currently, about 43 million individual birds are recorded, but that's just half the average of 30 years ago with double the count effort in terms of participant hours. So everyone's familiar probably with the decline of, of birds, especially songbirds in North America, uh, and that's just an illustration of, of that happening in reality. A little more on the history. The, the highest ever U.S. count, 250 species in a single day uh, near Matagorda, Texas. Highest ever count anywhere on the CBC, a pretty impressive 531 species in Ecuador on the slope of the Andes. I don't think we'll get there uh, on our count because we typically get about 160 to 170 species. We've been over 170 a few times, um, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that again this year. The first passing account was conducted in 1946. So this is, Luke is correct, this is our 77th year, but it's actually, since we're 1946 to 2023 inclusive, it'll be our 78th actual count. And all Christmas bird counts are conducted between December 14th and January 5th. And you can just search uh, the Audubon website to get a lot more information about counts uh, in general and any information related to them that you might want. That would be fun, as I did last year, to just put up a map of kind of the local area counts near us. Obviously, it's a lot more concentrated toward the coast and the greater LA area where you have bigger centers of population. But there are plenty of counts kind of outlying um, in farther away, less populated areas. Officially, uh, we are the Pasadena San Gabriel Valley Christmas Bird Count, and the Audubon abbreviation for that is CAPF, California Pasadena San Gabriel Valley. Our count circle center is the intersection of San Gabriel Boulevard and Duarte Road. Every count circle that's on land is 15 miles in diameter. And it doesn't seem like that much, but boy, when you drive across the count circle from one side to the other, it covers a pretty good amount of territory. It's actually 175 square miles. So some of the uh, important <clears throat> count areas we have in the Pasadena count are Mount Wilson, uh, giving us an opportunity for some high mountain birds, uh, at least those that might come down to lower elevations in fall and winter. The Greater Whittier Narrows area, the San Gabriel River, Santa Fe Dam, Eaton Canyon, San Gabriel Mountain, Foothills and Canyons, the Los Angeles County Arboretum and Huntington Gardens, each kind of offering its own special mix of, of birds and specialties. And here's a map of our own Pasadena Count Circle with a little bird in the center. So we encompass quite a good area, as you can see, off to the right here, uh, over to Santa Fe Dam. And I want to try and get my pointer set the way I wanted it before. Yeah, that's what I want. Uh, okay, so we covered a little bit of Santa Fe Dam. When they set up the count circle in 1946, Santa Fe Dam was just kind of under construction. So we don't get the lake, but we get a good chunk of the dam and some of the grassland uh, brushy areas, that were, which are nice, all the way up to Mount Wilson, just encompasses Mount Wilson, barely. Uh, over here to Eagle Rock Hills, 
and the whole Whittier Narrows area down here, and a lot in between. So the purpose of the count, create a record of bird life over time. Concentrating our effort in a count circle on a single day gives us a snapshot of a local bird life each year. And uh, Luke had kind of alluded to the fact that everybody loves finding rare birds and it's kind of exciting and they are a lot of fun and we usually get a, a number of them on each count. But the main thing we want to census is the numbers of our more common species. Uh, that provides the more important data as far as population trends. Uh, the count records patterns of eruptive, spe eruptive species, such as Lewis's woodpecker, varied thrush, red-breasted nuthatch, fine siskin, which are present in different numbers each year. Uh, most of these eruptions are based on food availability, the absence or presence of it, wherever they're coming from or going to. We'll get a little bit more into that later. And as I kind of mentioned, it documents increases and decreases in bird populations. It also, uh, especially for the Pasadena count in coastal Southern California, tracks uh, non-native and invasive species, of which we have quite a few. And it's really a great opportunity to participate in a citizen science project, just as eBird is. Um, there's not a lot of fields in science where just the average enthusiast or hobbyist can make a difference and contribute really valuable information. Christmas bird count is one, and eBird, of course, is another. So changes in the count over time. Uh, this is pretty much the same list uh, each year, but uh, great-tailed grackle and Eurasian collar doves over the last 30, 40 years have really uh, invaded and increased. Uh, the former is a native species. The Eurasian collar dove is non-native. Cooper's hawks and peregrine falcons have really bounced back since the 1970s when DDT was banned as a pesticide. Uh, so their reproductive success increased dramatically, and they're now both uh, regular on the count. Cooper's hawks in good numbers. Peregrine falcons, we always get a few. Allen's hummingbird is a native species that was primarily combined to the immediate coast, especially the Palos Verdes Peninsula, and now has spread well inland and is very, very common. Uh, and uh, also increasing species in a number of other non-natives. Declining uh, development on the coastal slope has result resulted in the loss of a lot of open spaces and grassland habitats. So as you might expect, some birds associated with that, like loggerhead shrikes, savanna sparrows, and western meadowlarks, have declined, but we still get them. Loggerhead shrikes are quite rare, though, on the count. We're lucky to get one or two these days. And spotted doves are pretty much extricated from uh, the count area where they were once quite common. That's another non native species. If, for those people who may not be old enough to remember when they were all over the place locally. And there's kind of static species that don't change too much. Red-tailed hawks, house midges, mooring doves, their numbers remain pretty uh, similar from count to count. They're all pretty much resident species and all very tolerant of human development, so uh, hasn't had too much impact on them. And then our introduced birds, parrots and parakeets, as everyone's familiar with, and as we were just talking about the uh, field trip to Temple City. gaily breasted munias, northern red bishops, pintail whitas, and more. We have a lot. A lot of well-established birds and a lot that are just a few or one-off escapees that we see. And then other changes, of course, as I mentioned, human development, uh, loss of habitat and gain. There's been some habitat restoration and uh, restoration of riparian habitat, which has been great for birds that are riparian obligates, obligates that depend on that habitat. And uh, another change, uh, as, as more and more birders have taken to the field and over the years, we've got a better knowledge of their birds distribution identification of birds uh, that may be a little harder to separate, and also where we can find specific birds. So we know exactly where to go to get certain species uh, so we have them on the count. And I put this same slide up last year, but it's kind of interesting. The first count in 1946, there were 28 participants. We averaged close to 50 currently. For some reason, we had no Cassin's kingbirds, and I can't imagine there were no Cassin's kingbirds at the time, but we have those well into double digits on counts now. And loggerhead shrikes and eye opening number 32. And as I had just mentioned, we get maybe one or two if we're lucky, these late, recent counts. They have 25 fox sparrows, which is a lot higher than we usually get. I just imagine maybe they birded the foothills more than we cover them now, because there's certainly a lot of fox sparrows around in the foothills. And northern cardinals, 
pretty hard to find on the count now. There's still a very few around in the Whittier Narrows area, but they had 33 back then. They've been introduced along the San Gabriel River and Whittier Narrows areas several times many decades ago and had varying degrees of success, but they're quite scarce now. So to transition on to count rules and procedures, the count period is midnight to midnight on count day. There's also count week period, which is three days before and three days after the count. So that allows us to count any species that we missed completely on count day. So if we got a barn owl or a peregrine falcon on count day, we don't care about count week. But, um, you know, say we had a ferruginous hawk fly over two days after the count and it wasn't seen on the count, we can include that as a count week bird. So kind of an important period to catch birds that we should have maybe had on the count, but just happened to miss on count day, but they are in the area. Uh, eight hours is the minimum counting period for the bird count. Now, that doesn't mean everybody has to count for eight hours. Don't panic. Um, but it, it, the count has to be run for an eight-hour period. Um, and we generally do far more than uh, eight hours. But that's for the count as a whole, not for individual counters. And I often get the question, what happens if it rains on count day? Well, we're, we're kind of stuck with it because a number of people uh, who do this count, including myself, have commitments to other counts on Sunday. And then where do you move it uh, that everybody's available uh, if you can't do it on the day you schedule it? So we have to go rain or shine. Fortunately, we've pretty, there's been only a, maybe three or four times I can remember that were pretty unpleasant rainy days. So generally we're, we have good weather. So I just checked the count weather for Pasadena uh, earlier today, and it says about 52 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, partly cloudy and calm. 77 is a little warmer than I'd like it to be. Just, uh, uh, activity seems to calm down more when the days are, are warmer, but we'll take the lack of rain. More rules and procedures. Uh, on the count, you can identify, you can count any bird that can be identified by sight or sound. And if you can't determine what a species is to the species level, say you see an exhibitor, it's either a Cooper's or a sharp shin hawk, or you see a goldfinch is maybe a lesser or an American goldfinch, or much more frequent, you see a gull and you can't figure out what species it is. Perfectly acceptable to include on your list gull SP, gull species, or exhibitor species. We still get to tally the numbers, but we don't know exactly what species they, they were. Uh, counting flocks of birds and estimating numbers. Uh, I have often found, I mean, learned long ago, I should say, that when I look at a flock of birds, I probably estimate half of the actual number of birds if it's a sizable flock of birds. So I always count half or count a quarter and multiply it out. Or if you take a photo, you can even count it later. But uh, I think people in general, are, humans are really bad at counting anything at like above 10. Uh, you get a flock of like 150 uh, black neck stilts on the LA River, for example, and you look and you go, no, oh, maybe 80 birds there, and you actually start counting them, and you're like shocked at how many birds there are. Uh, another thing we want to do is avoid double counting. For example, if you're hiking in and out uh, the same route uh, or at a feeder or yard count, if you're doing a feeder or yard count, you're really only allowed to count as many birds as you can see at the same time. Uh, otherwise, we can be tending to duplicate. Uh, say you hike in, one of our foothill canyons and you see five spotted towies on the way in and seven on the way out, you can just only count seven. Um, for bigger birds, sometimes it's trickier. Some hawks, waterfowl move around. So, you know, it's kind of using your best judgment for some of it. But just be aware that we try to avoid double counting birds. Uh, a quick note, I know a lot of people uh, use Merlin Sound ID and it's a great program and it's accurate probably 90 95 percent of the time but it does get things wrong quite frequently so it's good to use it as a guide or kind of point you in the right direction um, like i say most of the time it's right but it's, it gives you some very wacky errors on occasion but it is very helpful uh, some count challenges uh, what percentage of birds in the count circle do we actually count well probably a tiny percentage and it depends on the bird. Probably red-tailed hawks, we count a much higher percentage. They're conspicuous, they're large, they're easy to see. Um, birds like yellow rump warblers, which are just strewn throughout the foothills uh, where we can't even get access 
through residential areas where there's thousands of them, we can't even get access. And we don't have the number of counters to, to count them. So some birds like that, we're probably counting a tiny, tiny fraction of a percent that are uh, in the circle. And how accurately, uh, that depends on a few factors. We attempt to count the same main areas every year, often with the same participants assigned to keep it consistent. And they become more familiar with the area and what's there and where to find it. Uh, limitations, of course, um, the number of participants are a limiting factor. Uh, normally, we're pretty good shape. I mean, not have a shortage of participants, but that certainly you know, impacts the number of birds and number of species counted. And uh, we're all at different skill levels as far as birding. So the familiarity with the species and the count areas. Uh, some birders are going to be able to identify more birds uh, by sight and sound than others. So um, that uh, also impacts our count. So using uh, eBird, uh, preferably, I uh, would like everyone to submit their checklists uh, on eBird. A uh, paper list or emailed list uh, is fine if you don't use eBird. Hopefully everybody or most everybody does. For all checklists, whether eBird or uh, submitted any other way, uh, I do need the duration of the count, start and stop time. That can be discontinuous if you break for lunch. Uh, distance traveled, and that's just one way for in and out routes like a hike up a canyon. And mode of transportation, pretty much 99 plus percent of our transportation is on foot. And uh, the numbers are important to try and count as accurately as possible. So the advantages of eBird, it creates a permanent record. The data is available for anyone to use and view. And it's very easy to include notes and uh, documentation such as photos for unusual, unusual birds. And if you can use an existing location marker or eBird hotspot, hotspot if it's available for the place that you're counting. And if you can just email me your bird list via just a link to me uh, instead of sharing it. And should you be fortunate enough to find a rare bird, uh, documentation can and should include all of those shapes, size, color, and pattern, any field marks you note, uh, behavior, habitat, vocalization, how familiar you are with the species. And of course, if you have photos or audio recordings, that is great. And then I thought we'll, as we did last time, we'll jump into kind of a review of certainly not every bird we might see on the count, but kind of an overview of interesting ones and common ones and some uncommon ones. So did this last year. The Egyptian goose is a non-native species that's quite successful. If you go to uh, along any of our rivers or especially city parks, um, very successful uh, bird breeding locally, expanding. And this was on the left was a map from 2005 to 2010 of eBird records of Egyptian goose, and on the right from 2021 to 2022. I looked again this year, but it hadn't changed much, so I didn't change out the slide. But uh, and the orange markers are just birds that are uh, of recent sightings in the last 30 days, I think. But obviously that bird is increasing rapidly and doing very well. And in amongst our many Canada geese, uh, big noisy Canadas, most of which, uh, or at least many of which are, are really feral birds. They're not really migratory birds from up north, but they just stay here permanently and move around the area. Um, they're pretty recognizable, but every once in a while, especially at places like Leg Lake, maybe Santa Fe Dam, we get the smaller version, which used to be considered the same species, but now it's a separate species, the cackling goose. So with cackling geese, you look for the diminutive size. They're about half the size or less of a big Canada goose and that stubby triangular bill. But they really stand out pretty well among Canada geese and they're absolutely tiny. Uh, last winter, we had a big influx of uh, Canada, uh, sorry, white flounder, greater white flounder geese, uh, and they were everywhere. Uh, on the coastal slope, much greater numbers than they usually are. And this year, probably a few around, but not too many. There's always a few of the resident birds that never leave at Santa Fe Dam and a couple other places. But uh, it'd be interesting to see if we get any on this count, uh, since the numbers are much reduced from last year. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we'll get a Eurasian widgeon. It's possible to get this bird like this on the San Gabriel River or possibly at Leg Lake or Peck Road Water Conservation Park but a really attractive looking bird, at least this is a male. And I thought I'd throw in a couple other kind of neat, colorful, pretty ducks that we uh, often get, green winged teal and wood duck. Um, green winged teal, surprisingly for a quite common duck in the area, generally, 
is pretty scarce on the count. We may get a few of them at Leg Lake. Usually San Gabriel River is the place where we get a few of those. Uh, many years we come close to missing them altogether. And wood duck uh, often at the Arboretum someplace, sometimes elsewhere. But both pretty spectacular looking ducks. And then of course, throw this out there. If you see an odd looking duck that's shaped like a mallard, it's probably one of these domestic mallards come in all shapes, not sizes, but all shapes. Um, but the proportions and size are the same. And uh, just uh, we count those too for the for the CBC. Getting a little bit to uh, hummingbirds. There are basically two humming, hummingbird species that you're going to encounter on the count at this time of year. Uh, Anna's hummingbird, kind of the default resident hummingbird for most of the area. Female on the left, male on the right. So they're very similar to some other hummingbirds, but at this time of year, you don't have to worry about it as much because you only have these, this option and the next bird that we'll show in a second. But the adult males are pretty, pretty conspicuous and obvious with that kind of pinkish gorget and crown. Females are pretty plain, grayish below and green above. And then the other one that we get everywhere is uh, Allen's hummingbird. So if you see this rufous coloration on the tail, undertail, and on the flanks, uh, you can basically be safe in assuming that's an Allen's hummingbird. There are rufous hummingbirds that are very, very rare in winter and require uh, solid documentation, but probably 999 out of 1,000 are going to be Allen's hummingbirds. And uh, cormorants. We used to get only double crested cormorants, say 10 years ago, before neotropic cormorant had even been recorded in the county. Any inland cormorant away from the coast was a double crested cormorant. You didn't even have to look twice at it. If it was a cormorant, it was a double crested. Not so anymore. Neotropic cormorants have been expanding northward, and they're relatively, I won't say common, but it's not at all a surprise to see them in the county now, and sometimes in groups of five, seven, ten even in places. So what you want to look for is the shape at the base of the bill here, this patch, very straight up and down and double crested, this inverted V in neotropic. And that can be highlighted in, in white, very bright when the birds in adult and breeding colors. Also a much smaller, slimmer bird. I've kind of adjusted these photos to make the size comparison roughly accurate. Also look at the tail proportions. Much longer tail on neotropic, rather relatively short tail on double crested. And then I just have a bird in flight over here on the right, which has a, extends about the tail extends about as far as the head and beak. So uh, if it's got an equal length sticking out from both ends of the wings, it's probably a neotropic cormorant. And white tailed kite is a kind of a specialty bird that we usually get only at Santa Fe Dam if we get them. Uh, they've been difficult the last few years. Can also occasionally get them along the San Gabriel River, but um, it's a bird that fluctuates in population numbers in accordance with uh, populations of rodents, which are one of its its major prey. And they have they've been quite scarce the last few years, but they are quite pretty birds. And these are one of the probably for most birders one of the biggest challenges in uh, identifying hawks are Cooper's hawks and sharp shinned hawks. I had a little array here. Cooper's and sharp shin. These are fairly representative. Cooper's is a bigger bird with a bigger, blockier head. And immature juvenile birds have this long streaking, tear shaped streaking on the underparts. And of course, very, very good field mark are the length of the tail feathers. The central tail feathers are longer. Each outer pair is successively shorter. So you get this graduated look. And you can see it also here in the adult, adult bird. The adults are very attractive, very rust barring below and nicely, nicely patterned. So always look for the tail as well as size. They look more robust. Sharp shin hawks, as you can see here, various descriptions, the, like an ice cream scoop stuck on top of its shoulders, a little parakeet bill. I just think they're much more delicate and diminutive looking birds, a very skin, very skinny tarsi here, uh, even more so than a Cooper's hawk. Uh, another Feature is usually they have more blurry cross barring on the underparts, this being a, a juvenile bird. Uh, the other thing is, tail feathers on this bird aren't graduated typically. They're all the same length. So it gives us that kind of classic mark, which is not really 100% reliable at all, but a square tipped tail in sharp shinned hawks. And sharp shinned hawks, we only get in the winter and migration. 
Cooper's Oxford resident in good numbers and adapted very well to suburbia. So then an aerial shot, you see a bird flying over, um, several different features. Again, this blurry or streaking on a juvenile sharpshin and clean, even streaking on Cooper's. This is a very pronounced graduated tail pattern. So you see the outer feathers as they go further out are much shorter. Here on the sharpshin hawk, they're all about the same length. Now, if you get a Cooper's hawk missing a couple of tail feathers in the middle, it can look pretty square tail, but something to be aware of. But tail feather length is one of the best features for separating these, these two birds. Uh, sharpshin has a smaller head. Cooper's a little larger. There's a couple other features. Sharpshins usually say the wings project further up to the head, and Cooper's more classic profile like this. In this picture, it's not that obvious, though. And one more picture, even a sharp shin, very messy streaking underneath, very square tip tail because all those tail feathers are the same length. And another hawk, red-shouldered hawks. Um, not quite as large as a red tail, but larger than a Cooper's. It's kind of a forest hawk. You find them along river, river beds, river courses, and uh, parks and have mature trees. Kind of go in a, in a gradation here from a young bird to an intermediate bird that's kind of becoming more adult-like. You can see a bit of the red shoulder coming in here. And an adult bird is really pretty, strikingly patterned. Kind of like the Cooper's hawk in, in behavior and in, in habits and shape to some extent, but longer winged and with a much shorter tail, narrower borrowing, narrower barring on the tail. Um, but it's got that soaring hawk shape of long, broad, rounded wings and a relatively short tail. Okay, and then we come to our main big hawk, the red tailed hawk. Uh, these are both juveniles. Um, classic red tailed hawk has this belly band of streaks can vary quite a bit, but it's almost always there at some level. And this very narrow banding barring on the tail. That whitish modeling on the back can be another good, good mark. And I'll get to some other shots and some flight shots as well. So there's two more. Now, red-tailed hawks are one of the most variable birds, and especially hawks, in all of North America. They come in several different color morphs, um, and they're extremely variable. Uh, across the country from east to west and north to south. So there's a number of subspecies and they all look a little bit different. Uh, so here's a adult. You can see the red on the tail here and got the belly band. So that's, a, a, again, a good mark. Now we get a kind of rufusish morph bird here. Where you can still see a darkish belly band. Uh, that's a nicely patterned bird. Again, chunky, big legs, big talons, uh, a robust hawk. And then uh, in flight, they're almost easier in flight. Um, you get a typical light morph bird like this, and these dark patagial bars here are a dead giveaway that you've got a red-tailed hawk, whether it's an adult like this bird is or a juvenile. This one's got a very pale belly band, which shows you how variable they can be. But you see these dark patagial bars at the leading end of the wing, and you know you've got a red-tailed hawk. Now, the dark morph birds make it a little trickier, so you can't see it too well. Um, but dark morph birds make up a small minority generally of birds in our area. So this left one is the one you're typically going to see. Of course, helpful if it's an adult and it has the all red tail. And then owls. Um, Luke Tiller, Lance Benner, and Darren Dowell have all, I think, put in a lot of effort and time to find owls on our Christmas count. And we never had a lot of people who were really dedicated to doing that, but it's paid off uh, over the years. I mean, with good numbers of common owls and a few um, quite unusual owls, uh, like a spotted owl, which is very difficult to find, northern pygmy owl, uh, things like that. So here are two of the are more common owls, great horned owl on the left, our largest local owl, pretty easy to identify, very distinctive, and a typical hooting call is kind of a quintessential owl, owl hooting. And then barn owls on the right, which are really quite common, but easy to overlook. You often hear them letting out this kind of screechy shriek as they fly overhead. Um, and we miss these a lot, but I think it's just because people don't have a chance to go out and look and listen for them on, on count night. And then we go to falcons. Uh, pretty cool group of birds. Peregrine falcons and merlins, both members of the same uh, family. And uh, Merlin's are the small 
One's about the size of a kestrel. Uh, they're little speed demons. They never seem to lack energy. Uh, and then peregrine falcon, a significantly larger bird. Uh, these have a really noticeable mark here on the face. Merlin's very, very vague, very faint on a typical, typical bird. And that's brown backed, which means it's a female or immature bird. Uh, if I'd looked harder or someone who knows more about them could probably tell me if that's an uh, immature female or an adult, immature male or female or an adult female. The adult males are slaty, slaty blue gray on the back. Peregrines are pretty distinctive. And as I noted, both of these species, as well as Cooper Sox, have rebounded very well after DDT was banned in the 1970s. They were both doing pretty well. Both were rare in the 1970s in the count circle in the area generally. And now they're not unexpected at all. They're easy to find by comparison. Uh, another one that we might get, I know there's a handful in the county. There haven't been any reported uh, near the count circle yet. But these are possible in the foothills and mountains, and even around parks uh, and golf courses and things like that. Lewis's woodpecker is another one of those eruptive species that is present in differing numbers each year. But a pretty neat looking bird and very distinctive. They fly kind of like a small crow, but they don't look anything like any other bird, really. Now, I'd like to show off these common gallinules because they're just kind of neat, pretty, pretty birds. They're so much nicer than a coot. Um, but they're uh, kind of restricted to San Gabriel River, San Jose Creek, Lake Lake, uh, and that area. They're easy to find and fairly fairly common, and they can be kind of difficult to find almost anywhere else in the count circle. And another one of my favorites, uh, one of the rails, the Sora. You can get these at Lake Lake and along the San Gabriel River, and we do occasionally, but we often miss them. They can be quite secretive, except when they're right out in the full view like this one. And kingbirds, we get Western kingbirds in spring and summer. Uh, they are pretty much 100% gone at this time of year. So what you're looking for when you see a kingbird with a yellow belly would be a cassins at this time of year. Kind of a dark head, dark gray head with a contrasty white throat. No white outer tail feathers like Western kingbird. But we should get good good count of those uh, on the CBC. And I'll throw this one here just for fun. It's the more common of the Genus and Pinanax flycatchers, gray flycatcher is the most likely one that we'll get on the count, although we do occasionally get Hammonds and Western flycatchers. But... And kind of a crowd pleaser, the adult males especially, are these vermilion flycatchers that 10 years ago or so were almost unknown on the coastal slope uh, or very rare. And they have really increased in numbers to the point where almost any park uh, golf course can have one or a few of these these birds, and I still get a kick out of seeing them. They're, they're pretty, males are pretty spectacular. And the females are quite pretty too in a more subtle way. But we should have a number of these on the count as well. We do get swallows in winter. They're much reduced in number compared to spring and summer, but um, northern ruffling swallow is one we get typically every year. We can also get uh, tree and barn are the two others we most typically get. I kind of threw this picture in there because when you are just looking at birds, you're not paying as close attention to them as when you take a picture, but it's just remarkable how long those wings are, how long those primary flight feathers are. They spend most of their time flying, catching insects, so uh, they naturally need, need good flying equipment. And a question that often comes up um, among birders and is usually not too difficult to identify crows and ravens, but if you get one at a weird angle or not flying typically, uh, or not too close, it can be can be tricky. Uh, but you get American crows, both of these are very common in the count circle. Crows are a smaller bill without this long shaggy feathering here and a much slimmer bill. And this raven's head is big bill that kind of blends into the head. Crows, more of a typical kind of songbird looking rounded head and smaller bill. Much smaller bird, of course. Calls are quite different and can Find those on the eBird or your Sibley app will give you all the calls if anyone's not familiar with those. Uh, in flight, they're pretty easy to identify. Uh, again, the shape continues, smaller build, smaller headed. We get this big build raven here. Uh, not as evident in this picture, but crows have short, broad, rounded wings. 
Ravens have a longer, more pointed wing, and they're the birds that, that soar. Crows have a heavier wing loading. They're pretty much flapping all the time, occasionally gliding. But if you see a bunch of blackbirds or a couple of black birds up soaring extendedly and for an extended time, you can know for sure that those are ravens because crows are not able to do that. Tail shape is a good feature, rounded in crows and kind of wedge shaped in ravens. Ah. So we get a lot of ruby crown kinglets in the winter. They start arriving in September, and by now they're pretty common. So the only thing that you're likely to, I shouldn't say the only thing, but uh, you can confuse them with some warblers and others, but they're quite similar to Hutton's vireos. And Hutton's vireos you get in like the oak woodland canyons and uh, even elsewhere down into riparian woodland, they'll, they'll turn up. And the two, several ways to distinguish these two birds. Uh, ruby crown kinglet has a very thin needle-like bill much heavier hooked bill for the Hutton's Vireo. Uh, wing pattern here is, is a good clue. This has got more of an even pattern between the wing bars, and this area is light. You get this dark patch on Ruby Crown Kinglet below that second wing bar. So, so that wing pattern is a good way to distinguish these two. Calls, again, are quite different. And a close-up, almost in focus picture of a Hutton's Vireo, but it gives you a good look at the hook tip bill, a lot heavier than a ruby crown kinglet and not black like a ruby, ruby crown. And you see that wing pattern is very obvious here. It's, it's kind of evenly colored, not with a dark patch below the second wing bar. And red-breasted nuthatches. Um, we usually sometimes have trouble getting these on the count some years. They're tough to find. Um, that is not the case this year. Um, they're cool little birds. Here is the red-breasted nuthatch uh, eBird map from last fall, and here is the red-breasted nuthatch map from this fall. So, as everyone who's been out birding much knows, they are pretty much everywhere in the lowlands uh, this fall and winter, which is it's kind of fun. You hear them everywhere, and uh, I'm sure we'll get a good number on the count. Uh, but last year they were, you know, up in the mountains as expected, but down in the lowlands they were pretty much none. And a quick note of bluebirds. We, have, we can get Western bluebirds, of course, they're pretty common in parks, uh, open areas, and a uh, little rusty breast on the female. The males are pretty distinctive. Um, mountain bluebirds are a little paler, more washed out, a little bit longer wings, and they have this kind of distinctive turquoise blue coloration, which is this different from the blue, blue, more typical blue of uh, Western bluebirds. Mountain bluebirds were probably likely to get only a Santa Fe Dam if we get them anywhere. They like open spaces, but one to look for. And then the thrushes, Swainton's thrushes we get in spring and summer, scarcely in summer as a breeder in the uh, foothills. But at this time of year, the only thrush we're gonna get as far as Swainton's and Hermit is Hermit thrush. And Hermit thrush is readily distinguishable by this rusty tail and some in the wings as well. But Swainson's is a very evenly colored, and the Western race has a very cinnamon colored back. Look a little bit more like this bird. This bird's kind of paler, brighter because of the light. But always look for that rump and tail that's kind of rust colored. But that's the only thrush, spot breasted thrush, that you're going to see in winter. And Phenopepla is really cool, attractive bird. This is an adult male. And you find them often around mistletoe in the uh, fall and winter, and they, they often hang out at Peck Water Conservation Park and elsewhere. We usually get a handful of them on account, but uh, fun bird to see. And then uh, Los Angeles area, passing your account, has a big contingent of non-native birds. Uh, two common ones are red-crowned parrot on the left, yellow chevron parakeet on the right. Um, these sounds of these birds are pretty common and well-known to anybody in the area. Uh, and then a comparison of the lilac crown, which is a darker forehead, darker red forehead, and more lilac y colored crown, and then the red crown with a more extensive, more red red forehead and bluish here on the back. So slightly shorter tail on red crown parrot and slightly longer tail on lilac crown parrot, which is kind of distinguishable in flight generally. We should get both of those, but red crowns are the most common by far. 
and more non-natives. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with these. Uh, Scaly-breasted mumia, uh, formerly nutmeg mannequin or spice finch. This out of focus shot on the left is a uh, adult and uh, immature. They're pretty distinctive with these big conical black bills, um, typically found in like flood basins and along river channels, but they can turn up anywhere. They're kind of spreading and expanding. Uh, a week or two ago, there was one up at Buckhorn Campground at about 6,500 feet in the San Gabriel Mountains, which is kind of a surprise. So they can definitely get around. Red Western Bulbuls, anybody who's counting at the Huntington or birded the Huntington or Arboretum has run into these. And they're in the last decade or two, they've really started to expand out, especially in the San Gabriel Valley, where you can find them almost anywhere now. Not in, not concentrated in numbers as they are at the Arboretum or Huntington, but still uh, not too difficult to find. And Eurasian collar dove, a non-native, obviously, obvious where it got its name from. And northern red bishops, adult males are pretty pretty neat looking birds. Um, not no, not adult males, not males in alternate plumage are pretty plain, very sparrow like. But notice a very very short tail and this pale conical bill, pale supercilium. Get these in river channels primarily. It used to be north end of Peck Road Water Conservation Park was a great spot for these, but the water level has been so high the last few years that they're just no place, no habitat there for them. And of course, the kind of spectacular pintailed wide ass. The males have an extremely long uh, black tail, and their display flight is pretty, pretty interesting too. This is a female type bird, looks very, very different and lacks the tail, but that orangey red bill is a pretty good clue as to what you're looking at. And we did this one last year too, still waiting for this to show up in the count circle. I don't know when it will, but sometime in the next few years, probably. Swinnow's white eye doesn't really have a white eye, has a white eye ring. Looks kind of like a vireo or a warbler, but it, on the other hand, it doesn't really look like any native species. So that was the map, and it didn't change much between last year and this year, but they're definitely expanding and moving north. So one to keep an eye out, on, eye out for. Goldfinches can often present a problem. Uh, lesser goldfinch is a good clue. In addition to the overall color, it's kind of they're yellow and green, and they have these white extends down, but not to the tip of the tail. Whereas you can see on this American goldfinch, the white goes all the way to the tip of the tail, white under tail covers, and they have kind of a brownish yellow look, and these nice broad, often buff wing bars. We actually, we actually have a chance for three species of goldfinches. We go lesser green and yellow, and American yellow and brown. And then if it has any yellow on the wings here, adult males obviously pretty easy, but um, you don't get any other goldfinch species besides Lawrence's with yellow in the wings like that, those patches of yellow. Dip real quick into some sparrows, song sparrow, uh, the kind of default sparrow year round for us. Savannah sparrows, birds of open country, we get those at Santa Fe Dam. Notice how short the primary extension is here coming out from the tertials. Very, very short and very short tail, very pale bird. Um, longer wings in song sparrow and more richly colored. They can overlap in habitat, certainly. And then another song on the right for reference and two shots of Lincoln sparrow. Um, now these can turn up anywhere there's brush. Uh, one thing you want to look for is this buff breast. It's fine streaking, lacking in song sparrow, at least not in, ju in juvenile song sparrows. You can get that same pattern, but more finely marked, a smaller bird, a little more delicate bill, this nice buff wash on the breast and fine streaking underneath. Chipping sparrow is another one we can get in parks and open lawn areas. That's an immature. We won't see those at this time of year. They have streaking underneath. Winter bird, plain winter bird looks somewhat like this, though. One of our smallest sparrows, the genus Spizella. A cool one that I think is Rufus crown sparrow. You find these in the foothills. Uh, and oak, uh, chaparral hillside uh, is their favorite favorite kind of habitat. Kind of a subtly colored sparrow, but quite quite attractive, I think. Everybody's familiar with dark-eyed juncos. There's several different kinds. We got a, a male here, a female type here, and then we also have slate-colored juncos, which are just plain and evenly colored. Uh, they're pretty distinctive. We should get a few of those on the count. We see a lot of house finches. Male here. 
uh, that can range from red to yellow to orange. Most of them are red, though. And the female, very plain faced. Purple finch is another one we can get uh, on the count and should have some. Uh, that its bill doesn't help illustrate what it looks like, but it's got this pretty strong face pattern, which is a good clue. House finches are just kind of blank faced bird. Little chunkier bird, shorter tailed. Golden crowned sparrows, uh, often in the chaparral. They're not anywhere near as widespread as white crowned sparrows, but we get these up in the in the chaparral areas quite commonly, actually, in the right habitat. The gulp on the left and the immature on the right. Just thought I'd throw this in here. We're close to the end. Brown-headed cowbird and fairly closely related brewers blackbird. Uh, Brown-headed cowbirds are almost more like finches or sparrows with this really short conical bill. That's a female. The adult males are pretty distinct with a black body and brown head. Now, female brewers can be all brown, pretty much like this, um, but notice the bill shape, distinctly longer, more pointed bill on a brewer's. And orange crown warbler, one of our fairly common uh, warblers. That's a typical coastal Southern California race. Very uniformly colored, kind of yellow uh, green. And there, we also get on occasion, and there's been a few more around this fall than, than typically, I think, is the gray headed type, which is a presumed subspecies Orestra. Um, the eastern subspecies, too, I think, has a grayish head, but uh, this is a great basin race we presumably get here in small numbers in winter, but it has this definite grayish cast to the face and a little bit duller. And about on the last two slides of the photos, yellow rump warbler is one of the most common birds right now in the count circle. Uh, highly varied throughout the year. Here's an adult male, which is pretty bright, pretty conspicuous. These flank patches and this really abbreviated yellow throat patch. And we also have myrtles. Uh, they're both yellow rump warblers. The Audubon's is the western subspecies. Myrtle is the eastern. But we do get a few myrtles out here. Um, they're not too difficult to find. Um, they have this pale eyeline or supercilium and also the whitish throat instead of yellow. And it curves around the side of the auricular as it does on this bird. That kind of illustrates the full, you can see anything in between these two birds in terms of plumage. And for just for fun, because I got this, I thought was quite a nice shot of a white crowned sparrow. Uh, very, very common winter visitor. And we'll get lots of those uh, on the Christmas count. I like the fact that they sing all winter. I really like their, their song. It's kind of one of the iconic bird sounds of winter. All right, so that almost wraps things up. We just got a few more slides here. And we're right at 8.30. So good birds in the count circle. I'm being a little optimistic with this list. Don't tell hawk is probably a good bet. Uh, bird or two been hanging around Monrovia for months, if not years. Uh, there was a Lewis's woodpecker at Mount Wilson a little while back. Uh, Darren had, had a Pacific wren, uh, a gray-headed junco uh, at the Hahamanga Watershed Park. Um, so they, Junko almost certainly is still there. Pacific Grand, I'm not sure when it was seen last. There's a swamp sparrow and a hooded oriole at the Huntington Gardens recently. Black and white warbler at Hahamanga. Uh, Nashville at the Huntington Gardens. Uh, this is the one that I'm kind of reaching for. This is seen once three or four weeks ago at the uh, Hahamanga Bay Breasted Warbler, which is a great bird at that time of year or in winter. Could still be around, but, and then chestnut sided warbler has been there also. It's been a pretty productive spot this fall. Um, that bird was reported again recently. There was a painted red start in Arcadia at a private residence, and I'm going to see if there's any way we can get that checked on count day. And a summer tanager at the Arboretum. So all those good birds already known to be or were at least within the last few weeks in the count circle. So this is going to be, this section is easier than it was last year. Uh, Darren Dowell had put a lot of work into this, and uh, along with a couple of others, came up with the idea of having a page on the uh, Passing the Audubon website specifically to get it dedicated to the Christmas bird count. Um, so what you'll find at this link is information about the CBC, uh, count assignments, available areas, opportunities to join a group with contact info, and info about the uh, Christmas bird count dinner. So passingaudubon.org slash CBC. So it gives everyone at their leisure to kind of take a look and see what's available, see where they might want to go join the count. And uh, makes it quite easy. So contact me or Darren Dowell or the area leader on that website. 
to select the count area. Avoid over, overlap duplication of count areas. If you finish with your area and go, oh, maybe I'll go count such and such, just do make sure that uh, it hasn't been spoken for since. Um, we try not to double count areas, but uh, especially places like Livingston, Graham, Gravel Pits, uh, maybe Leg Lake, maybe Peck Water Conservation Park. It can be worth counting that again later in the day because uh, gulls often tend to congregate in numbers later in the morning or in the afternoon. And if we miss the species that we hope to get there in the morning, we might be able to pick it up in the afternoon. And the count night dinner, which we already uh, have discussed at 6 p.m. on Saturday, December 16th after the count. Uh, here's the place to register and pay. Uh, we'll have some good food. We'll do the count wrap up. We'll go through the species list and see what everybody saw. It won't be complete because we'll still be getting reports coming in later, but it'll be a pretty good uh, basis for, for how we did on the count. And uh, again, we'll do the CBC photo show. So uh, when you're out on the count uh, with your phone or your long lens camera, uh, if you get any pictures of good pictures of common birds or good pictures of rare birds or bad pictures of rare birds, uh, people participating on the count, actually doing the count or count locations, um, by all means, uh, send those to me, hopefully by 4 p.m., uh, which will give me about an hour or so to throw it all together into a PowerPoint deck, and we will get to view those uh, photos uh, right after dinner. 6 p.m., Saturday, December 16th. Everybody have a great count, and I'd be happy if there's any questions to take those at this time. Are there any questions? Nope. I can't believe I was that thorough. Um, Oh, what are the times for the locations? Uh, that will depend on the individual leader. I imagine most people, except for owling, are going to start around between 7 and 7.30. But that's up to each individual uh, area leader. And uh, that contact info is on that website uh, Well, with email addresses, then you can get in touch with them. Or if you prefer to just uh, check with me, um, I can get you in touch with a leader for that area. And anybody has any questions on count procedures or where to go or what's available, um, check the website or email me. What's the menu for dinner, depending on food restrictions? Uh, uh, it'll, be, it'll be chili, uh, um, two different, the original chili, and then one is going to be vegetarian with cornbread and some cookie cider and beer and all kinds of goodies. All right. Any more questions? If any questions come up after this or if you have any trouble uh, getting uh, hooked up with a group to go uh, on count day, please let me or Darren know and we'll help work that out. And I uh, hope everyone enjoys it. I hope to see everyone at the count dinner. Uh, that's always really fun. Uh, again, we go over the list of birds and we have the slideshow and uh, we have some food and have all the work behind us and we can just sit and relax and enjoy. John, if we're a new birder and we're new to the bird count, do we just kind of find one of the groups that has like on this website where you've noted that um, kind of anyone can show up or do we wait for an assignment? I would start with that website. And if you find something uh, that appeals, a location that appeals, I would contact that uh, area leader. Um, if you have any trouble getting connected with uh, a, an area or a counter, just let me know or Darren, and we will uh, we will definitely get you uh going with with someone but yeah unless someone emails me directly uh asking i won't have any way to to, to reach out to help assign someone but feel free to email me directly if you, if you need any assistance or want information uh about the area or procedures and you know we want this open to to everybody definitely um 
we want to you know get beginning or newer birders interested in it. It's a really fun event uh, and it's worthwhile scientifically and for the data. And we want uh, everybody to have an enjoyable time and you know maybe you'll get into it and you'll make it an, an annual thing. So uh, one question. So if we have decided to join, uh, like I, I was going to go to the Cobb Estate, then do I just email Lois and she will yeah. give me the information about what to do next? Correct. You can, you can just email that area leader uh, directly and mm -hmm. they will let you know uh, exactly when and where to meet uh, for that area. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. It was a great presentation. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I wish I could remember the birds. But... Uh, well, that takes a lot of time. That takes a long time, but it'll, it'll come if you keep at it. Yeah. John, there might be new people that don't know what these different areas are. If somebody wants to to just say out loud now what they're looking for, what kind of terrain or, you know, then that leader could explain. Yeah, if you're looking, I mean, some people are up for hiking. Um, I generally don't like to have to hike when I'm trying to bird, but some places you have to, but uh, other people want like nice flat walking um, or want something closer to home. And, and of course, don't feel like if you sign up for an area, you have to go count for four, five, six, eight hours. Um, you know, it's it's kind of to get you involved and get you uh, familiar with the CBC. If you can only show up for two hours or three hours, um, I would say go, uh, learn, enjoy, have fun, and and you know just uh, just get into it and see if it's see if it's something you like. But yeah, if anybody has specific uh, questions, uh, I don't know if ask here or certainly shoot me an email, and I can kind of help guide people as could Darren to an appropriate place. You know, that might be uh, closer to closer to home or more of an area that you're interested in counting. Uh, John, I see that Karen has a hand up. Go okay. ahead, Karen. Hey, John. <clears throat> yeah, I'll I'll um do the Grand Park in Monrovia, and oh um, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll sit out in my backyard and try to get zony. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be great. Today I had a peregrine falcon and a merlin and a bunch of, I don't know if they were um, swifts or swallows, way up high today. Okay. Yeah, if it was a big bunch, probably white-throated swifts, but you can get fairly, fairly good size. I think they were flowers. white. Zooming in on them, they kind of look like swifts. Um, yeah. I couldn't so funny to you don't see them with the naked eye at all and then you zoom in on your peregrine and you go wow look at yep. all those guys <laughs> I, there's so many i've missed swift so many times until i was looking at something else or heard them mm -hmm. but yeah if they're not making noise they could be almost impossible to see but yeah then, as, darren, as darren noted in the in the chat we'd love to get the zone tail hawk again for the count if you're able and merlin's been picking up some crazy sounds in my backyard. It, it said I had a white-tailed kite yesterday, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. It does some weird stuff, but it is, it's a great tool. Yeah, it really, it's fun. I enjoy it, yeah. All right. I'll, a, I'll email you. Okay, yeah. There's happy, a to answer, happy to help or answer any questions via email if uh, anyone, uh, and I don't know if, is uh, I'll put my email in the chat here. I don't know if it's available. Looks like somebody's interested in joining a nocturnal group to look for owls. Yeah, I, I can take that question. Um, this is Darren again. Um, on the website, there is a list of nocturnal sites. So far, uh, not too many people are claiming those. <laughs> Either getting up early or staying up late I, maybe doesn't appeal. But uh, I, I'm doing uh, an Arroyo Seco uh, nocturnal trip starting at 5.30 in the morning, and uh, people are invited on that. So you can contact me um, uh, if you are interested in joining that. I hope some other people will pick up some nocturnal sites and they, they might uh, invite uh, others, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but anyway, we, we've got plenty of other good places in the area that will have owls. Uh, but they have not been claimed yet.
All right. If anybody has anything else, we're done, I think. So uh, enjoy the count, have fun, and hope to see everyone uh, at the dinner on Saturday at 6 p.m. I just want to give shout out to John and Darren for putting all this together. Um, countless hours spent on this, trying to make it more, you know, more accessible and more cover more areas. It's just a lot of work. So thank you both so much. Yeah. And Darren was largely responsible for the website page. Oh, and Chris for updating the website. So everyone, really great work. And um have fun Saturday and hope to see you at the dinner. Will it din uh, chili and see the birds? Bye bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.